first reading is Psalm 148. Uh, it's on page four, um, 633 of the Church Bibles. Psalm 148, page 633. A psalm of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He set them in a place for ever and ever. He gave a decree that he will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all the nations, you princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendour is above all the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. The second lesson is taken from Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17, in the Church Bibles on page 1184. And this is a beautiful reading from Paul. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of God dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for those readings and good morning everybody. I've been away for a couple of weeks really and uh, it's just lovely to see everybody again. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> well, verse 16. We've, we've already done that. You sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. I'd just like to thank the musicians, wherever the musicians are, <laughs> behind me, in front of me, um, for, for that. I mean, it's just a privilege to be able to, to uh, sing along and, and just praise together. It's, it's wonderful, isn't it? So, we are continuing to explore the idea of Christian gratitude of various kinds. In a nutshell, this series covers what we are grateful for, why we should be grateful, and how to show gratitude. This morning, we're thinking especially about how we should behave towards each other if we are a grateful fellowship of believers. But first, let's pray. Lord of wisdom and love, please be with us now. Guide our thoughts and transform my clumsy words 
Speak to so that each individual one of us can take on board what you want them to know today. Amen. You may want to keep your Bibles open on page 1184 of the Church Bibles um, to follow as I, as I go along and sort of dip in and out. The Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter from which we have just heard, he's very concerned about clothing of a very particular kind. Remember his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, where he talks about putting on the armour of God. Well, this time, it's about changing into the right clothes. But what's the dress code? Here we are with one of Paul's letters written about uh, 62 AD to the fellowship of the believers in Colossae, which was in what we now call Turkey. Paul's letters were a major way of teaching in the different churches that covered such a large area of the Mediterranean, and, and because of that, you, you couldn't possibly keep in touch with all of them in person. Actually, did Paul visit Colossae? No. We know this because he mentions a chap called Epaphras twice in this letter, and uh, Epaphras was a missionary to Colossae. Probably he was a convert from paganism, and he came from around that area. Paul affirms Epaphras' authority when he calls him our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, always wrestling in prayer for you. That's a great phrase, wrestling in prayer. But that's probably another sermon. Paul is saying, you can trust this guy. He's a godly chap. The church there would be made up of the exiled followers of Jesus, mostly Jews as well as recent converts. They were all people who were profoundly affected by what they'd heard about the events of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. And this fellowship would gather, I'm guessing, in the temple or maybe someone's home to hear what Paul was teaching them. What we sometimes forget, well I do anyway, is that the events which led these people to a life of following Jesus, these events were actually part of their own life story, assuming they were over the age of 30, because Jesus was their contemporary. The letter was written in AD 62. If they're over 30, they would at least have uh, been around when Jesus died and was resurrected. Jesus lived in the same world as they did. Those who had happened to live in Galilee, Galilee or Jerusalem, they would have been breathing the same air as Jesus, walking almost literally in his footsteps. Maybe they had known him, even seen him grow up. The events we now read about in the Bible were truly life-changing then, as they are now. But you might think, how much more challenging, exciting, innovative, frightening even, was it when you were actually around at the time? When it wasn't history, it was breaking news. It was really important, and it still is, for the Fellowship of Believers to know how to behave in the light of the miracles that had happened, that had happened so recently and how to prepare for the time when Jesus returned for the judgment. In Paul's time, they thought it was going to be imminent any time soon. In other words, the believers must have been thinking, what now? Where do we go from here? Which brings us to the letter and our passage. But earlier in the chapter, Paul has been saying that in the light of the amazing events of Jesus' life, death and resurrection, we must change our mindset to things above. Things to bring us to the state where we are so much like Jesus Christ that our lives as Elaine or Karen or Mark are hidden with Christ in God. Less of us, more of him. Less of Elaine, more of Jesus. In verses 5 to 11, Paul lists what things we should stop doing in response to what God has done for us. Um, there's quite a formidable list, actually. Uh, and it's not easy. Um, 
I know I struggle with some of these. Um, I won't say which ones. Um, so the list includes sex, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So we, so we must put to death, rid ourselves of the old wicked ways of the world. He's saying that was then, this is now, so we must change. Take off our old selves, as we would take off our, our jacket. Put on the new self, verses 9 to 10. We can see there that Paul is bigging up, bigging up, encouraging the fellowship, saying that they have already taken off their old clothes. That actually, the long list of negative things in verse 5, they've already put on the new ones. They've got rid of those, they've put on the new ones, the new self. And he even suggests that they are already becoming like God himself by doing this. And he, Paul, is absolutely right. We need to build up, not knock down, encourage, not discourage, emphasise the good in people, be mindful of the blessings people give us, sometimes just by being there. Be grateful for the times when others show generosity and their gratitude to us too. I have a Christian friend who is a great example to me. It took me a while to realise it, but I began to notice that every time I said the slightest negative thing about someone, he would find something positive to say about them. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of an example without naming names. But So I might say, I wish so-and-so would stop moaning about such and such. It drives me mad. And he might reply with, but they moan because they really care about it. Why don't you get together and see what you can do to help? Or something like that. Mm. That's how you do it, isn't it? It was my friend's way of gently correcting me. He was admonishing me, really. And it took me a while to realise it, but I think I got there in the end. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means, any stretch of the imagination. But at least I've got it in my mind that I must be careful. And if you don't already do that trick, have a go. Try and think of the positive, not the negative. Practice makes perfect. Or maybe not perfect exactly. Not this side of heaven. So verses 12 to 16, Paul encourages, encourages us in two ways. First, in our Christian identity. He reminds us that we're God's chosen people. We're holy. We are dearly loved. I think it's true that uh, whatever you're, you're told about yourself has an effect on you. I remember as a child, I think I was seven, I got four out of ten in a maths test. And I just, I, I was told by the teacher, you're rubbish at maths. You can't do it. And, I, and that's stayed with me forever. I know I'm rubbish at maths. That's never going to change. In fact, I married an accountant, partly for that reason. But... <laughs> But also um, because I get almost hysterical when he talks to me about, about the figures, about the figures of our household and so on, not because they're in, we're in the red all the time, but, but um, just I just can't, I think I'm mathematically dyslexic is how I, I would explain it. And I'm sure it has an effect. Likewise, we're at secondary school, I was told... Um, I was in the front row of the chorus of the Pirates of Penzance once. <laughs> Shows how old I am. They don't do Gilbert and Sullivan anymore, do they? Um, and uh, and my teacher, one of my teachers said to me, Oh, I saw, I saw you in the... Oh, that was really good. And actually because of that, I started to um, uh, do drama as a hobby. And it was through drama because I met my accountant husband. So there's a sort of nice symmetry going on there. So we are encouraged to change, to be dressed in new clothes. It's not always easy, and we need lots of practice, as I say. And with some of these, the list is compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. So I looked them up. Compassion is about learning to empathise with someone who is suffering. Be alongside them. 
and to feel compelled to reduce that suffering. And we can do it person to person, but we can also empathise with the people of Ukraine, for example. And there's lots of ways we can help. We pray, as we have just done, and uh, send money and so on. There's kindness, well, be friendly, generous, considerate. Humility. No one of us is better in any way than any other of us. We are all equal in Christ. Incidentally, when I googled humility, this came up. Humble people handle stress more effectively and report higher levels of physical and mental well-being. They also show greater generosity, helpfulness and gratitude. All things that can only serve to draw us closer to others. Gentleness, mildness of manners or disposition. And this is the one I really, really struggle with. Patience. The quality of being patient is the bearing of provocation. Putting up with it, with provocation, annoyance, misfortune or pain, without complaint without losing our temper, without irritation. Patience is also quiet, steady perseverance, even tempered care and diligence. Well, after this, verse 13 sums it up, saying, bear with and forgive. The, the idea of accepting one another is not that we should not keep one another accountable, but rather that we should love each other in such a way that reflects the love of Christ to the world outside, including both discipline and forgiveness. I think those two go hand in hand. When conflict arises, this is a really testing time, but we should meet our troubles head on, always ensuring we are clothed in God's uniform. And then enveloping all this, I visualise us wrapped up in a cocoon. There's compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience and they're the layers underneath. And over that there's the outer layer of love. Verse 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we have the overalls of love. I remind you of the first verse of the old hymn. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind. In purer lives your service find, in deeper reverence praise. And so, on June the 5th, when we have our jubilee celebration and invite our neighbours in Church Road to the party, my prayer is that they the good people of Church Road spend time with us and go home thinking, hmm, that church lot, you know, I, I can't put my finger on it, but there's definitely something different about them. They seem to have something I haven't. So if they can see us like that, then that's evangelism. So don't just speak the gospel, wear the gospel. I like being a bit unconventional, so bizarrely, I'm going to close by reading the beginning of this letter. And so as I speak verses 1 to 6, I'm going to alter it a little so we can relate to it a bit more closely. And as I read, just see how it makes you feel when Paul addresses us in this way. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's people, God's holy people, in St. Philip's Church, Wolverhampton, Parish of Penfields, the faithful children in Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of the people of St. Philip's faith, in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. 
the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in Bradmore. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout Wolverhampton and the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. Do you feel validated, built up, encouraged? If so, what are you doing about it? Does it make you want, even long, to be someone who is clothed in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience? To be someone who can bear with and forgive? And then be someone who binds all these qualities together by putting on love, covering yourself in the same love Jesus showed us, his love which keeps all these righteous qualities within us. So, what's the dress code? It's not about fancy dress, pretending to be somebody we are not, but we are called to change, to put off the old smelly, dirty clothes that can only go to the tip, and put on the clean, fresh, sweet-smelling, pure clothes. What's the dress code? Dress to impress with righteousness. And so I'm going to finish in prayer, incorporating words from Colossians 3, 17. Lord, in whatever we do, whether in word or deed, help us to do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen.